This is CBC Here and Now. Physical distance is required in every single public, public and private space in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, except at school. A rally at Confederation Building to protest the back-to-school plan as the Education Minister announces new changes, including more buses. The regulations about when high school students have to wear these in class have changed. I'll have more coming up on Here and Now. It's cruise ship season in Cornerbrook, but of course there are no cruise ships. We were on track to be at 10 million this year. So very, very significant losses for the, for the region. That's all because of the pandemic. I'll tell you how that's impacting the port and the city. The calendar may say September, but that doesn't mean that we're gonna say goodbye to the summer-like weather. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Education is our focus tonight. An education rally is wrapping up at Confederation Building at this hour where teachers and parents are lobbying for more supports as classes are set to begin next week. We'll have a live report from Peter Cowan just ahead. But some of the teachers' demands have already been met with an announcement today by Education Minister Tom Osborne. He announced a long list of changes for students and teachers regarding masks, public exams, busing and more. Here announced Heather Gillis has our top story. You're in the right place. School reopens in just over a week, but teachers head back tomorrow to prepare for the year ahead. Today, Education Minister Tom Osborne promised changes, including masks. They'll be mandatory for students in grades 7 to 12 when physical distancing of one meter or more isn't possible in the classroom. It's because of the concerns raised by educators, primarily on, uh, on social distancing within classes. Another change, more buses. Osborne says more than 6,000 students in the province will now have a ride to school. By the end of September, every student who is eligible for school busing will have school busing. Uh, it won't all be in place at the first day of school. January's public exams are cancelled. He'll make a call on June's exams later. Osborne also says there'll be more student assistance, public health and occupational health and safety resources, and there'll be resources for virtual learning for students and families who are immunocompromised. We have the balance here, obviously, uh, the need for, for education, for the socialization uh, of students, for the mental health well-being of students. Uh, by being back in school, we also have to look at the health measures. Two meters is what's required in a community centre. Why is that same standard not applicable to our schools? Teachers call today's announcement progress, but NLTA President Dean Ingram says he's having trouble rationalizing why there's still a discrepancy between public health guidelines and what will be required in schools. We need to enhance the protocol surrounding mask wearing. We need assurances that necessary personal protective equipment will be available for teachers at their workplaces. We need to ensure there are measures put in place that should there be an outbreak or a suspected outbreak, it can be dealt with sooner rather than later. Minister Osborne says he'll announce more details on Thursday, though he does say most of these initiatives will be funded through the $26 million from the federal government. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Teachers and parents are welcoming some of those changes from the education minister, but say there needs to be more. They held a rally this afternoon. Here now is Peter Cowan is there live. So Peter, what are teachers asking for? Anthony, what we're hearing from here is a group called Safe September NL. It's independent, but the rally today did get some help from the NLTA. In fact, you can see a bunch of their signs around here as uh, parents and teachers all shared their concerns about what they've heard so far from the government's plan. And a lot of what we're hearing here today is anxiety around the fact that many of the measures that exist elsewhere in communities are not going to be happening inside schools. Things like physical distancing. We heard from one of the teachers that organized today's event that she should be focusing on getting ready to teach students, but instead she's worried about how safe the environment will be for them. I'm really not supposed to be here today. I, I should be planning for my classroom. I should be enjoying my last day before I go back to work tomorrow. Um, I would probably be home. <laughs> 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 
there are a million other things that I thought I would be doing right now, um, and I didn't think I would be standing up in front of a group of people, but I do not believe that, that normal for schools was working before, and I do not think that it should be reinforced again now. So what we're also hearing from today are from parents who are expressing concerns about sending their kids into a school that's going to have the same number of children. And the issue of smaller class sizes is something we heard uh, today, especially from teachers. This is something that the teachers union has been pushing as an issue long before COVID. And they say now in an environment with COVID-19, the issue of distancing is even more crucial and having cl lower class sizes is a way to do that. But interestingly, we heard from uh, one parent who also runs a business who said it, it, she's struggling with the inconsistencies here, that at her business she has to take all these extra measures, but when her child goes to class, those measures won't be there. Physical distance is required at every single public, public and private space in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, except at school. It's non-negotiable everywhere we go. Anything less than smaller class sizes during our, in our schools during a global pandemic, be it low prevalence or not, is simply irresponsible. Irresponsible. Now, the plan that government is implementing does have the sign-off from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, says she does believe it is safe to have children in classrooms, and by doing things like cohorting, keeping one class of students together, she believes that it will be safe this September, especially when this province right now only has one active case of COVID-19. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. Well, CBC News has obtained documents that show the Eastern School District started ordering protective equipment for teachers and students more than a month ago. But will that gear be enough given today's new directions on masks in the classroom for junior high and high school students? Here now is Mark Quinn has more. The documents show the school district was already stocking up on PPE for schools like this months ago. On July 31st, it issued tenders for more than 70,000 face masks face shields and desk shields for students and teachers. The documents sent to CBC show the district is expecting 1 in 10 students to get symptoms from things like colds and flus during the school year. One of the tenders says assume 10% of children will need masks for sickness. When the school district plan for reopening classrooms was announced two weeks ago, this is what it said about masks. Two washable and reusable non-medical masks will be made available to staff and one per student in grades K-12 to for use at their discretion and when required as per recommendations by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. But now that's changed. This is a government policy. We're going above and beyond uh, what the Chief Medical Officer of Health has put in place here. Uh, masks will be mandatory, as we know, in common areas, uh, in hallways, uh, even in the classroom until a student is seated at their desk. Once at their desk, if a, if a distance of one meter or more cannot be maintained face to face, uh, then uh, the uh, masks will be required and that will be for grades 7 through 12. So where will all the masks come from? The school district says that to date it's committed more than $300,000 for disposable and reusable PPE for staff and students. An Ontario-based PPE manufacturing company is lending a hand. Canadian Shield says it's going to donate more than 7,000 face shields to schools in this province. That will help, but the province's plan for masks has evolved, and the education minister says more details are coming on Thursday. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the newly elected Grand Chief of the Innu Nation wants stronger rules for campaigning to prevent candidates in Natwashish and Sheshishi from influencing voters with alcohol, drugs or money. 
Last month, the day before the Innu Nation election, 26-year-old Ryan Nook was killed. He was reportedly leaving a campaign party that offered free alcohol to guests. Nook was killed by a vehicle while walking along Route 520 outside Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now, a number of people have accused Edian Rich's campaign team of throwing that party. The new Grand Chief says he wasn't there and that he didn't know about it. But Rich says election bribery has been a problem for quite some time. And at the next Innu Nation board meeting, he'll be discussing campaign rules that will apply to all three Innu organizations. There are new details in the fatal helicopter crash earlier this summer at Thorburn Lake near Clarenville. The privately owned Robinson R-44 helicopter crashed while attempting to land for fuel in June. The pilot and passenger in the front suffered injuries. The passenger in the rear died. New information shows that the pilot hovered about 75 feet above the ground preparing to land. A report from the Transportation Safety Board says that's when the chopper began to pitch and the pilot lost control. The TSB says the main rotor blades touched and severed the tail, including the tail rotor. The helicopter and tail then fell to the ground. Well, police say there is no truth to social media posts or rumors about an active shooter in Holyrood or Conception Bay South this morning. The RCMP's Holyrood detachment says it investigated several calls and determined there was no shooter. Police say there is no threat to public safety and are asking people to stop sharing social media posts saying otherwise. The privacy breach at the province's labor board is under the microscope. This after the agency leaked the identities of trades workers who were trying to form a union at the massive Greek aquaculture operation in Placentia Bay. The MHA for the area says some of the workers who signed union cards were then laid off. Well, here's where the story gets even tanglier. If those workers wanted to challenge their layoffs, they would typically go to the Labor Relations Board, but that's the very entity that shared their private information with Grieg in the first place. The Labor Relations Board meets in this building, but it's not talking about this privacy breach. Jeff Dwyer is the MHA for Placentia West Bellevue. So, Mr. Dwyer, what are your concerns about this breach? Well, I mean, it's, uh, you know, people have the right to uh, sign union cards. Uh, you know, we understand that the Labor Relations Board is in place uh, and it has a good purpose uh, to give people the, the ability to assemble. Uh, with that being said, you know, uh, it's usually the Labor Relations Board that uh, accepts the signed cards, uh, finds out that if these are actual employees from uh, that company and uh, they can ratify uh, those cards based on uh, that information. So if you have uh, skilled tradesmen uh, who want to form a union, how is it possible these cards would end up in Grieg's hands? Uh, in, in this case it was, uh, uh, you know, it was a mess up I guess or a flub uh, I guess kind of thing. That's what we're hoping for sure. Uh, we, don't, we don't think that it was is an ongoing thing. Uh, we just want to make sure that uh, you know, people do uh, have that right. Uh, in this situation, it was the Labor Relations Board that sent these cards back to the employer. So therefore, uh, you know, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. What impact has this had on any of the workers? What we're calling for really is an independent investigation. Uh, and I think all that would come out in that. Uh, we're hoping that there uh, wasn't, but there seems to be on a timeline that uh, there might be a lot of coincidences here. What do you mean? Uh, that there was people laid off after uh, this list was received, whether that's a coincidence or it was the fact that the list was acted on, that's what we'd like to know through an independent investigation. Okay, but just to be clear, are you suggesting that maybe Grieg said, okay, there's the union troublemakers, let's get rid of them? Uh, that's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that the, uh, the list was released uh, to the employer. Uh, we would like to know uh, if that was acted upon. Uh, you know, people do have the right to uh, to be unionized, uh, and and it goes back to the privacy part of it. Is the whole point of, uh, you know, it's it's a a benefit to collective bargaining. The NL Federation of Labor says revealing private information about people with the legal right to form a union is a fundamental violation of one of the pillars of labor law. It's put unions uh, in a position where there's a trust issue with the people who they're signing up that's been breached. Uh, it's absolutely flawed now, the whole legislation and the process that's been a sacred 
uh, part of our legislation for a long time. What we've asked for the minister to do is intervene immediately and put something in place immediately to uh, rectify this particular situation, but also to make sure that it never happens again and that uh, workers and unions can earn the trust again of the process. The government, like the Labour Board, is staying silent about this privacy breach. Premier Andrew Fury shuffled Jerry Byrne out of fisheries and aquaculture. Among Byrne's new responsibilities, labour. It's not acceptable, nor would I ever make a comment about an administrative procedure within the Labour Relations Board being a quasi-judicial body. Now, in his old job, Jerry Byrne embodied the government's full commitment to support aquaculture and companies such as Grieg. Now is the time for the Liberal Party of Canada to clarify that they're where they sit and to do so not just from a policy point of view, but to actually say and say it out loud, maritime aquaculture in Newfoundland and Labrador is sound and will be continued. Well, the government kicked in $30 million to Grieg's Placentia Bay project, boasting that it would create 800 jobs, and some of the people getting those jobs want a union. Mysteriously, the company got inside information on who those workers are. In a statement this afternoon, Grieg says it does not agree with how MHA Jeff Dwyer has characterized the situation. The company says it can't comment any further because the matter is before the Labour Board. COVID-19 pandemic has cancelled all cruises to the West Coast, which means the 2020 cruise ship season is cancelled in Cornerbrook. The suspended season is hitting the economy hard. Here now is Colleen Connors reports. Usually large ships are docked on Riverside Drive this time of year. Tourists walking all over the city. This year, nothing. Government suspended all cruise lines in May. More than 20 ships were expected in Cornerbrook this season, and that loss can be felt by many. The Port Corporation estimates a $10 million loss to the economy this year. Well, you'd be surprised how many people are actually involved in helping make um, the passenger experience a really great one. Tour guides, bus operators, cab drivers, musicians are all out of money this cruise season. Local craft vendors like Jeff Smith makes intricate pens and bottle openers from discarded moose antlers. He sells them to passengers dockside. He can make a couple thousand dollars from each large ship that docks. Like it probably takes me four or five months to get ready for like really a two month season. And now this year is a zero season. Smith is just sitting on a garage filled with product. Passengers also like to shop while they visit, especially at the Newfoundland Emporium, a store and museum. The owner is now selling, partly because business is so slow. It's not desperate, but it's not very good. The problem is that you have to have a real good summer, a couple of months, in order to carry you through the, the other period, which is absolutely dead. You know? Small town, getting smaller all the time, our store is too big. The Port Corporation is able to offset some of this year's loss with a new agreement with the International Shipping Company. But the loss of the cruise season could be felt next year if COVID-19 is still rampant. We have um, cruise, cruise lines scheduled to visit Cornerbrook next year just because, again, they, they book so far in advance. And um, we're still keeping those lines of communications open to all the other ports in the region. And I mean, some of us are, are expecting another um, suspension for 2021 because it is a possibility. We really don't know what's going to happen. They are just waiting for more direction from Transport Canada. Well, if and when cruise ships do return to Cornerbrook in 2021, the big question is, will locals embrace those international travelers? Well, it's really hard to know if there still will be fear around travel. It really is a wait and see game. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, last night we talked about concerns from the new Canadian community about a recent uptick in out migration after a cluster of Syrian refugee families decided to leave St. John's. But as Cease Hair reports, numbers show not everyone who arrives on our grey, foggy shores seeks greener pastures elsewhere. Four months ago, Muhammad Talal Aisiadi opened a store on La Marchant Road in St. John's. He admits it was a rough start opening a new business on the heels of Snowmageddon. I sell uh, uh, 
everything for food, uh, international food, uh, all this international food. Everything from crackers, cheese, canned goods, sweets, kids' treats, condiments, soft drinks. A mechanic by trade, he left Syria in 2011, moved to Lebanon, and then Turkey. He and his wife and kids and many other Syrians came to St. John's under the federal government's Syrian refugee resettlement program. Yesterday, he had now told you about an uptick in the number of Syrian families leaving St. John's this summer, heading for the mainland to find work. Isiadi says he understands why some people leave, be it for work or family, but it's not in the cards for him. He knew nothing about Canada and less about Newfoundland when he arrived, but since landing here, St. John's has become his home. I like the city and uh, my, my children who has friends and uh, go to school. And this is good for me and I have good neighbor. People, every, I don't uh, see any people bad. Every people friendly and nice people. The province says it's exceeding immigration targets and is improving the retention of new immigrants. For all of the classes of economic immigration, um, we are achieving over a 50% rate of retention of, of high, high quality resettlement that where people feel comfortable about staying. That's actually better than many Atlantic Canadian provinces. Byrne says while that rate is encouraging, there is always room for improvement, adding the federal government has a role to play in making that happen. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. It's almost like heaven. I was intended to be here. I don't know why, but I'm intended to be a St. Pat's. And he's there this evening making local sports history. This legend of local sports will umpire his final game. Coming up, he'll talk about spending five decades of his life steeped in sports. It's going to be a chilly night tonight, but the rest of the week looking much warmer with some humidity moving in. That also means we're going to see some rain for parts of the province. I'll have all those details and your full forecast coming up.
The last time I spoke with Ashley Brawweiler, it was snowing. It was March, and we didn't really know what self-isolation was. Good to see you, Ashley. It's nice to see you too. Yes, very different uh, weather than last time. Yep. I got to sp uh, speak to you for sure. A beautiful uh, evening today, much different, at least less windy than what we were seeing yesterday. Let's take a look at the temperatures across the board. A little bit chilly as well, a little bit of a nip in the air if uh, once that sun goes away. Temperatures today sitting around 16 degrees for uh, St. John's. And then we've got temperatures pretty much at the same point, around 18 degrees for Badger, 17 for Stephenville. And then uh, temperatures much warmer uh, for Happy Valley Goose Bay, sitting around 19 degrees this afternoon. So a beautiful day. Uh, we can thank a ridge of high pressure for that, and that's dominating the weather. And as we head through the next couple of hours, things will really start to clear out across the board. And because of that, there is a frost advisory in place from Burgio to Green Bay White Bay and all the way over to Clarenville this evening, particularly in those low-lying areas where we'll see those single-digit lows tonight under clear skies and calm winds. And that's pretty much the story across the board, although we will start to see some cloud cover move in with some showers for areas in Lab West. Uh, through the night and continuing through the first half of tomorrow morning. But there's those temperatures. So single digit lows, uh, 10 degrees in St. John's, the winds generally light. And then we've got temperatures around 9, 10, 11 degrees up through the big land. Uh, 11 degrees will be the overnight low in Nain. Now tomorrow that high pressure will dominate again certainly for the island and southeastern portions of Labrador. But that rain will spread across the big land pretty much through the day with some periods of rain, which may be heavy at times. Uh, more so as you head through the overnight, there's some heavier rain there uh, moving in overnight into Thursday morning. So tomorrow is going to be gorgeous temperature wise, uh, 20 degree days, 20 low high teens, low 20s for most of us with winds generally 20 to 30 kilometers per hour, 20 degrees for Cartwright, 22 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. But again, that rain will move in and then eventually late day, we'll see the potential for some showers to move in along southern portions of Labrador, or uh, southern portions of the island rather. So I wanted to show you this. It does look like we're gonna see some humidity return. This is showing us how much moisture is in the air. So the yellows and the oranges are the humid air and the blues and the purples are the dry air. So watch what happens as we head into Thursday. Some of that humid air makes a return and it's gonna stick around pretty much through Friday and then eventually clear as we head into Saturday night into early sat Sunday morning. And with that, we're going to see the potential for some showers, which will be heavy at times, certainly into Thursday night, uh, early Friday. We could see the potential for some heavy showers for southeastern portions of Labrador. That could even be some thunderstorm activity as well. But eventually we will see some clearing with that. So. These are your temperatures, 20, 22 degrees, but again, with that humidity making it feel a little bit warmer, that rain will move in late day Thursday for eastern areas, but overall it will be a generally gray day for the island and southwest or southeastern portions of Labrador. 20 degrees for Cartwright, 18 for Nain. So another gorgeous day. Temperatures do dip a little bit for you on Friday, but again, even warmer for the island, 22 to 25 degrees it looks like uh, through the day on Friday. And as we head into the weekend, that rain will eventually make its way towards eastern areas in, uh, of the island in St. John's and 24 degrees at this point. But once that clears, Sunday, even Monday, looking pretty beautiful for the long weekend. Last official, I like to say, long weekend of the summer. Uh, here's what central and western Newfoundland are looking like. Your rain will end uh, through the day on Saturday, Sunday clearing out beautifully. But again, those temperatures shaping up uh, to be a pretty spectacular weekend in those 20 degree ranges. And then for eastern Labrador, 18 degrees by Saturday. Sunday, a little bit more cloud cover in 15, but uh, wet Lab West, you're going to hang on to the chillier temperatures. Saturday, 9 degrees and 11 on Sunday with some peaks of sun. So I wanted to share this uh, beautiful photo from Trout River. Colorful sunset. Christopher sent us that great shot. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Thanks, Ashley. Well, local sports history is being made right now at St. Pat's Field in St. John's. Tonight is the last time local sports legend Carl Lake will umpire a game. For a man who has devoted most of his life to local sports, it's an emotional moment. I spoke with him about it this afternoon. 
the St. Pat's ballpark here is basically my summer home since 1958. I came down here as a kid about that height, uh, came down to watch a baseball game, and I haven't left since. I mean, it's my home in the summer. I'd leave and come. As a matter of fact, I live in Circuit Road. I come down through a garden up here and come down to the ballpark. We come down to play ball here in the morning and then come down and watch baseball in the nighttime. This, this is my home. I'm at, this is where I'm most relaxed the same patch, whether I'm umpiring, whether I'm just down watching the game. This is my home. What is it about this place that does that to you? It's the mystique of being here, the people you've met, the people you've known over the years. You can, you can hear the ghosts of people down here when they play. The respect that's here from people and the friendships I've made over the years, my dear, is unbelievable. And I don't think I could have made them anywhere else but down here at St. Pat's. Well, I don't think there are too many people in town who could say that they've been coming down here for 50-odd years. 53 years umpiring baseball. I've been here since 58 as a kid. I used to sell hot dogs in the canteen there and go around and sell chips in the sands, right? But. It's home. It's, heaven. it's almost like heaven. It, it, I was intended to be here. I don't know why, but I'm intended to be a St. Pat's. And today is a bit of a special day for you. Can you talk about what's going to be happening later? Um, unfortunately, as I said, and I won't go into details, but my health reasons, um, I can't umpire baseball because I'm afraid if I could break a bone, I could be in, in serious problems. But uh, this will probably be, I'm hoping it won't, but I know it will be. Uh, my last game as a baseball umpire, I'm going to do first base tonight. I want to do one more to make sure I got my 53rd year in umpire and baseball. And it means a lot to me, it means a lot to my family and uh, to my, my umpire friends. You've devoted a lot of your life to sports in this province. Oh, a fair bit, yeah. I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I think uh, I've covered everything from uh, peewee hockey to the Nationals, the same with baseball I've done from peewee, peewee baseball to the Nationals. I've been involved in sports, that's just my life. That's what we grew up with as kids, we grew up in sports. and then. It fell into jobs, you know, at, at first it was with uh, the Daily News, then CJO, and then I went to CBC, and then I got in with VOCM, and I came back in the media and, and followed, and I got my own sports page. So it's just something, that is love of sports, trying to promote the local people. You can get national anywhere, but local has all of a sudden been shoved aside. We're in an unprecedented time in in sports locally where uh, things have been put on hold. There's all kinds of new challenges that have never been faced before. What do you think when you look at the state of local sports right now in these COVID times? In the COVID times, it's sad because I can tell you from like we're going to umpire tonight. We'll have one guy to stand behind the pitcher's mound and I'll stand here at first base. You're not behind home plate, so there's things you can't see. It's a different world, a different situation, and they've done everything they can to protect the people here, and, and God love them, they're doing that. The kids are enjoying the game, but they're keeping their distance, which is great, but they're still enjoying their friends around the sport of baseball, soccer. Something had to be done, but at least, look at it this way, Carol, they're playing sports this summer. Regardless of COVID or not, they came out and said, we're playing sports and the hell with that virus, great. It kind of seems like sports is in your DNA, even just the way that you're talking, <laughs> <laughs> the way you present but yourself, see, I, I it's up, very much a sports, you're a sports man. Yeah, well, I grew up in a neighborhood that we played, if, when we were home from school, we played street hockey. We came down here in the summertime, we played soccer over there when that was a soccer pitch. But we, that's all we ever did in the summer and the winter, we played sports, we developed that relationship. And we had to get out, but of course your parents said get out of the house anyway, so we got out of the house and you played sports and the people you've met over the years, I mean, I bet you I could fill this field with people I've met over the years through sports, just to in Newfoundland alone. That's not counting the mainland people. This evening is probably going to be an emotional time for you. How, how do you think you're going to be feeling tonight? I, I'd say at the start, I'll, I'll be anxious to get out. Of it. But I think, and, and excuse me if I break down, but uh, I, I think at the, at the end of it, I, I'll say, you know, I, I'm sorry to leave here. I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm not allowed to do it. But you know something, Carolyn? I've had a great run of baseball as an umpire, and I've enjoyed it immensely, but I will come down to the ballpark. But I'd love to be out here every night, and if, if, uh, if things change around, who knows, but I, I can't see it right now. Well, Carl Lake, good luck this evening. Well, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time to share some memories. Any time, my dear, you want a memory, I'll give you one. <laughs>
Uh, well, this is the day before teachers go back to work, and today some of them attended a rally at the Confederation Building to protest some of the government's back-to-school plans, and we're going to have more of that for you later in the program. If you're watching earlier, uh, Peter Cowan uh, joined us live, and we're going to have more from that rally coming up in uh, just a bit. Obviously, heading back to school is uh, the major topic on most people's minds, and uh, we'll have that for you a bit later on here and now. To a national story now, the dark past of Canada's residential school system is being formally designated as an event of national historic significance. Two former residential schools will become national historic sites. Portage La Prairie Residential School in Manitoba and Shubenacadie Residential School in Nova Scotia. Now, Shubenacadie operated for 37 years. It was run by the Roman Catholic Church. There's nothing left of that school. A plastics factory now stands in its place. And earlier today, the CBC's John Tatry spoke with one of the school's survivors. Alan Knockwood was out with his godson this week when he decided to show him the old Shubenacadie Residential School. And I said, well, this is where the rest of the school was, and, and uh, you can sense that what the site looks like now and what, what the site I remember are two completely different things. The truth was Knockwood survived three years at the school, starting when he was nine. Staff beat him when he spoke Mi'kmaq, shamed him for being Mi'kmaq. Many horrific memories, too personal and painful to share. People are scared to use the words like Holocaust, all right? genocide. They're afraid of those words because they speak the truth as to what happened to the native peoples of Canada. The school is long gone, replaced by a plastics factory. We're looking at a site that is completely erased. What they wanted to do has worked. They erased history. Today, Jonathan Wilkinson, Minister for Parks Canada, said the site of the school, and one in Manitoba, will become national historic sites. To all those who suffer discrimination, mistreatment, abuse, and neglect in residential schools, we are sorry. While these designations will not undo the harm that was done, it is my hope that we can learn from the past and continue to advance our journey of truth-telling, reconciliation, and healing. Knockwood says the school is not really a chapter of the 14,000-year Mi'kmaq history in this land. What it is is, is a, a very strong affirmation of colonial history. It's their will over ours. And it points out the, the helplessness that we experienced back in those days. Knockwood holds no grudge against the plastics factory, but he hopes it can be moved off the new National Historic Site. He'd like to see the land left open so the wound can heal. Knockwood sees hope for the future in the students at the nearby Sabaganagadi School. You have a child walking up to an elder and uh, there's, they're, they're, they're asking, how are you? And, uh, and all I can answer back is a half English word, awele. You know, it sounds unwell. Knockwood says he's learning from the young Mi'kmaq people. He thinks everyone should. Both societies can open up to greater communication and peace. John Tatry, CBC News, Sabaganagadi. As I mentioned before that piece about residential schools, this is the day before teachers go back to work. And today, some of them attended a rally at the Confederation Building to protest some of the government's back-to-school plans. Here now is Peter Cowan was at that rally, and Peter joins us live once again. So there's some concern, Peter, on the part of some teachers and parents who say they, they just don't feel it's safe with a back-to-school plan. Tell me about that. Anthony, yeah, there were about 100 people or so that I counted here at the rally. Uh, it wrapped up about half an hour ago, but over the course of the two hours, we heard from more than a dozen teachers and parents expressing their concerns about the back-to-school plan. The two big requests that they had from organizers here was, one, they want smaller class sizes to allow physical distancing, and two, they want online earn learning options for parents who may not feel comfortable or for children who are sick and have to be out of class. Here's a bit of what was said at the rally today. But it was one of the hardest years of my teaching career trying to keep classroom management for 26 children. And coming up for next year, I am very concerned about how that's going to look when uh, some of the safety precautions they're telling us to do, such as go outside, 
that was a struggle for me last year was to bring my children outside on my own we had one and again that'll be a struggle for just for the teachers now as they push for going outside because of the ventilation issues we are way behind the clock in making the preparations for return to school in a safe September. We, we just had a change in the uh, instructions around mask wearing. Why wasn't this in place at the end of July? Why wasn't this in place at the end of June or May? All of the arrangements about safe return to school have an ad hoc, done in haste, afterthought flavor to them. We have a premier who likes to boast, a new premier, who likes to boast that he follows best evidence. Well, let's hear from him tomorrow afternoon when he does the public briefing about the pandemic as to how he thinks the best evidence has been applied to keep people safe in our schools. My children thrive with the teachers and staff in their school. However, I am scared that allowing my children to return to school without adequate safety measures will result in them becoming a statistic of COVID-19. And that's what they will be, a statistic. The government of Newfoundland and Labrador clearly states on their website, and I quote, the potential risk of COVID-19 spread is highest when individuals are indoors within two meters of each other for more than 15 minutes in a small space with limited ventilation. It's right on the website. Go ahead and read it. <laughs> but this is exactly what we are now being told to do with our children. Send them into overcrowded classrooms with no guarantee of physical distance, indoors for longer than 15 minutes, with little to no ventilation. Anything less than smaller class sizes during our, in our schools during a global pandemic, be it low prevalence or not, is simply irresponsible. Some of the voices that you heard there at the rally, um, you heard from the PC leader there as well. Uh, here at the rally, we did hear from other parties like the NDP. And I should point out that the education minister, Tom Osborne, was out here for the full two hours of the rally, spent most of the time standing at the side listening, spoke a little bit at the end, uh, and uh, he did get credit from organizers for coming out and listening to those concerns directly. Reporting live at Confederation Building, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now.
an update now on the concerns surrounding Governor General Julie Payette. The federal government has hired a private consulting firm to help look into the accusations that Payette and her second in command have verbally abused staff at Rideau Hall. The CBC's Evan Dyer has the details. It was back on July 23rd that the government initially announced that there would be some kind of an investigation into the claims of harassment and bullying at Rideau Hall by the Governor General, by her secretary, Asunta Di Lorenzo. Now we see that a firm, a consulting firm based in Ottawa, Quintet Consulting, has been named to carry out that investigation, that administrative review. Uh, this is a firm that's done a lot of work for the federal government in issues of harassment and respect in the workplace, typically getting uh, at least a few contracts every year. It's been involved in some fairly high profile cases. Uh, including the case of Senator Don Meredith, who was uh, ultimately forced to resign from the Canadian Senate after admitting to having a relationship with a teenage girl. So Quintet Consulting now has a mandate to speak to current and former staffers at Rideau Hall. Some of them have alleged that there's been a very toxic climate in that workplace since Julie Payette became Governor General. Uh, a lot of bullying, a lot of yelling in meetings, belittling of people, belittling of their work. Uh, one former staffer referred to every meeting having to have its victims. So Quintet Consulting will now interview everybody involved, including presumably the people who are alleged to have been the bullies in this matter, Julie Payette and her secretary, and then will deliver a report later this fall to Dominic LeBlanc, the chair of the Privy Council, who, of course, is himself the son of a governor general. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Chelsea, Quebec. In an ongoing series we're calling Drawn to It, CBCNL is introducing you to local creators and pulling back the curtain on their artistic process. Now you might recognize the work of Morgan McDonald. We've featured him on Here and Now several times over the years, but you might be surprised to hear the sculptor doesn't consider himself a success. So my name is Morgan McDonald. I'm a sculptor and I own and operate the Newfoundland Bronze Foundry. This is a, a lost wax bronze foundry. I always tell people, you know, there's two different, I guess, art forms here. There's the sculpture part of it, which is the artist role, which is, you know, who I am as a sculptor, that, you know, you create these sculptures. But the foundry aspect of it is the the casting, the, the mold making, that's, that's, that's almost like a trade. You're creating a clay statue, uh, you know, that's the first step. You sculpt that, that's the artwork. Then with the clay, you have to create a series of, of molds to get to the bronze end product. So the bronze is the part that's permanent, that's forever. Clay doesn't last two seconds outdoors. It, it, uh, it will melt away in a heartbeat. So what you're, what you're really trying to do is preserve your artwork for the ages. Any artist in any chosen career path, it's incredibly difficult. You can listen to a lot of these, you know, I guess self-motivation stories and they start to ring kind of hollow after a while when you're not getting to a point of, uh, you know, success or, you know, actualization. It sounds so corny and so, you know, so, so Tony Robbins-ish. But if you put the effort in, you're bound to hook something. But, but there, there's a bit of uh, mental toughness in it as well. I don't know how it looks like from the outside looking in at my, I guess whatever you want to call it, success. What, I don't know. I don't even think of myself as successful. You're always trying to push the boundaries. You don't ever get to that point where you say like, yes, I made it. And then you get on this, like, this road that's smooth and everything, you know, every, all these opportunities are being, you, you, you make your own opportunity. Some of the advice that I tell any other artist searching for the thing is uh, try to be the most authentic you that you can be because trying to copy someone else, you're, you're never going to reach that level of interesting, sublime excellence, however you want to define that, by trying to be the best whatever somebody else is. It's, it's nobody can copy who you are. I mean, you are innately you. It's, it just happens by virtue of of existing. So uh, try to develop that and, and go to the depths of your perspective, your voice, and your experience. And uh, if you uh, cultivate that, 
I, I think that's where the interesting subject matter will come from. Was well, you heard a chilly night, but uh, things aren't that bad, Ashley. No, they're certainly not. Uh, after tonight, things will actually be fairly warm as we head through the day tomorrow. Another, or the ridge of high pressure is still very much in place for the island and southeastern portions of Labrador. However, the rest of Labrador, you're looking at some rain, which could be heavy at times through the day. Pretty much continuing as we head through Thursday, that's when we'll start to see that rain head towards the island. All right, definitely going to close the door to my greenhouse tonight. Good idea, good idea. <laughs> yeah, Carolyn, I was sort of checking out my uh, Twitter account there during the break, and uh, a lot of teachers have taken to social media because tomorrow is the first day back for teachers. Of course, students, depending on what grades they're in, will be heading back next week, and there's so many stories to be talking about. Oh. For instance, uh, one thing we haven't touched upon, but uh, lockers, right? So there's no right. lockers. So come the bad weather, I mean, Ashley's talking about how nice it is and things are, you know, cold night, but it's getting better. What's going to happen with all the coats and stuff? And the boots. Plus, 
What kind of cool posters did Carolyn Stokes have inside <laughs> her locker is what I really want to know. New kids on the block, of course. New kids on the block. Okay. <laughs> Dating myself there for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think mine was Marilyn Monroe, so don't feel too bad. Uh, but what about the lockers? Uh, yeah. Not just that. And of course, uh, the minister, Tom Osborne, made it very clear he's going to have some more announcements on Thursday. I think the biggest angst issue out there is still the issue of school buses. Mr. Osborne saying he's going to have that. So many, many more announcements to come about education over the next coming days and into next week. And of course, here and now we'll have extensive coverage about education. It seems to be the number one associated uh, story with the pandemic. And of course, the reality is that we're relatively COVID free. So deep breaths. Yeah, deep a lot breaths. of parents wondering what's going to happen next and uh, we'll be covering it all. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, have a great evening. See you tomorrow.